Hi, welcome to AP Live. If this is your first day or your third day, we're glad you're here. So here's what I want to ask you. Peanut butter and jelly, Batman and Robin, bears and Packers, all relationships. But what do they have to do with AP Human Geography? So let's find out. So what we're going to do is we are going to look at how geographers use patterns, relationships, and outcomes in AP Human Geography to understand the world that we live in. How are we going to do that? Well, today we're going to identify spatial relationship skills. We're going to examine the skills through content. We're really going to use a lot of your unit two population demographics and connect it to a few other units as we're moving throughout our lesson today. And then finally, what you really probably want to do is we need to, how do we apply these skills and content through practice questions? So the first thing before we can really dive into those skills is we want to make sure we're all on the same page with spatial relationships. Okay. So what we're trying to do is analyze those relations among and between places. We want to look to how do they reveal those important spatial patterns? How do we do that? So some concepts that we can include absolute and relative location. We talked about those in our big ideas a little bit. Place, what is it like there? Uh, space, that area occupied. Remember we talked about clustered or distributed or dispersed. We could talk about distance decay and the interaction based off of where you live also in video number one, um, the flows, the movement of, of ideas and goods and people in and out of areas. Time space compression, we could talk about technology and its influence um, and its impact on those locations, and then really diving into those patterns. And so we're going to look um, at how these spatial concepts can unlock the skills. So what do I mean by skills? Well, the first thing we want to do is describe those spatial patterns, networks, and relationships. So what are those characteristics that you see that we either on that map or in those areas? What Go back to that idea of place. What is it like there? We're also going to explain those sp uh, spatial relationships in a con uh, spe specified context or world region. And what do we mean by that? So remember, when we talk about explain, this is the how and the why. So those processes, models, theories, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of those examples. The difference here, when we say explain, we're still on how and why, but a likely outcome. Okay, so we want to understand the relationship in a specified context. Now what we want to do is what would be a likely outcome of those events? or those models or theories. And then we also want to talk about the significance of the similarities and differences at different locations or at different times. And so we'll dive into, for example, the Green Revolution and talk a little bit about Mexico versus India. And then finally, explain the degree to which a geographic concept, process, model, or theory explains the geographic effects in different contexts or regions of the world. The tricky part on this one is that explain the degree to which. So when you tune into our seventh day, when we look at um, mistakes and understandings, we're going to really dive into explain the degree to which. But what we're really looking at here is kind of that idea of a lot, a little, increase, decrease. And so we're looking for the kind of those trends overall. So we're going to look at some examples today. And really, this is where we get into the heavy content. So remember that first skill, describe spatial patterns, networks, and relationships. So the very first thing you should do is kind of what do you see? What pattern do you see when you look at this chloropleth map? Do you notice India, China, how they are uh, more heavily populated. So right now you would just want to identify that describing. So China and India are more heavily populated. Um, we see the United States, we look at Brazil, we could also add in describing that in terms of looking at, um, to take it in terms of looking at maybe some um, patterns of population where we look at patriarchal societies versus matriarchal societies versus um, we could look at antinatalist or pronatalist approaches. And so we're adding more characteristics to those areas, which we're going to layer in throughout today's lesson. But in my head, when I start looking at population, I start thinking of characteristics. This is just looking at overall population. 
might also be that composition, right? That gives us more information. So I mentioned patriarchal versus matriarchal. So don't forget about these population pyramids when we take a look at male and female distribution. So this is looking at world distribution. We're going to look at uh, national or country level here in just a little bit, and then even in the United States, look at a state level. So we can see some of those nuances. But we can see if we really dove into this kind of, typically we see women are living longer than men are living, if we really dug into kind of at that global level. But what we want to do then is how might that impact other things? So maybe we're looking at a share of population that's female. And we're really going to look at, again, describing what do we see? What jumps out at me, obviously the bright red on the Arabian Peninsula, but how about North Africa, Southwest Asia, South Asia, East Asia, and the kind of that palish, pinkish red color that stretches through that area. And so then what we start to say is how do we describe what's happening there? And so we start off by describing the pattern of the regions, and then we could describe Maybe we get into some, um, we saw China had high birth rates, very agricultural based, lots of kids needed for those farms. Um, China or India also agricultural based in this region. So we see that need for a lot of workers. What about also a lot of these areas uh, maybe are more patriarchal um, in nature or they've got an economic boom and they're building in so certain areas on that Arabian pen Peninsula where we're asking for more men to come in to help do some of those building materials. So my point is, is what we just did there is we identified what we see across that map, but then we gave some characteristics as to what else could be happening in those areas. The compositions, if we really dive into looking at um, our population pyramids at that national or country level. If I look at Denmark, we see a more evenly distributed population pyramids. If you look at the question at the top, this PSO, this is our patterns and social organization. Back to our first video, right? Big ideas, thinking like a geographer. So how does where people live impact those global culture, political, and economic patterns? Well, I said this in video number one, Northern Europe rocks, but why is that? We all we know gender equity is higher there. Male and female um, are, a little, are more balanced in terms of managerial positions, in terms of education levels, um, in terms of pay. And so what we start to see is things start to balance off. We also know that... Um, we know that they're more in that tertiary economic industry. And so we see um, people not having as many kids to work on the farms. So again, what we're doing is we're describing, right? Giving lots of examples. Omen, you think Arabian Peninsula, we just saw more of those, those pink and brighter reds. This shouldn't surprise us if we see it's uh, definitely heavier with males. But if we really look at look at that age structure, really our workers, right? So we could start talking about the types of jobs, um, the building of, of buildings, the um, we could take a look at other industries that typically tend to be more male dominated industries, maybe such as the oil industry um, that are going to be pulling more and more men to that area. Again, we could also reflect on patriarchal society that might influence this as well. So what we're doing is we're coming up with characteristics that reflect what we're looking at. We can continue to dig in. Okay. So same question from that big idea, but now look at, we're going to dig into more. We're looking here at Pennsylvania and Colorado. And so I'm sure you've seen some of these, but if I look at the population pyramid um, from Pennsylvania, we're going to see a lot of 20 year olds, right? We see kind of this, this little boom, you know, the 15 to 19 year olds. And then again, the 20 to 24, well, would this surprise you that this is a college town, you know, that we're, we're taking a look at where um, we've got a college here. And so it's going to draw that age group to that area. I'll be honest with the one to the right. In Colorado, I had to do some digging. I didn't know much about this county and I didn't know why we were seeing the inverted pyramid. If I had shown you Florida, we would start talking about retirement, right? Where we see an older population. So there's a couple things that tend to be going on here. There's a little bit of that draw, um, but what we're starting to see is that um, if you really dig into it, 
they're talking about needing to recruit a younger generation is that people are tending to not have as many kids here anymore. And so they really, what they're looking at is just, it's people are living longer. You're not having as many kids. And so it's kind of a byproduct of that. It's a really small um, populated area here too. If we look, I mean, you're only talking, you know, a few thousand people if we really dig into this. Now, the reality is on a test, you're not going to Google what's happening in, in this county in Colorado. However, what we're looking for is, can you identify and describe that trends? And so what you would talk about is clearly we see population is aging. They're living longer. They're not having as many kids. We could talk about types of businesses. You could talk about, so definitely more in that service tertiary industry. Um, they're not needing as many kids to work on the farms. Probably we could assume or make some assumptions highly educated as well. So I shared with you kind of what I had to research, but how I would tackle it if I was presented with this without knowing um, what was happening in Colorado. So we're going to shift now to our, so if first one was described, now we're going to explain those specific spatial relationships, okay? So the how and the why. So again, I would always do that first thing of what patterns do you see and then go into the how and the why. So I have this... Um, taking a look at um, some climate trends here um, to on this screen as well. And what we're really looking at is starting to understand, dig into where we're going to go here, but what are those trends? We look at um, the temperate zone kind of through our mid latitudes. We look at our tropical zone between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. What we want to understand is kind of the impact that has on crops. We want to look at the impact that that has on productivity, population density. So this might be the why, but how does it then impact those other things? So theories, right? So it talks about models or theories. So let's look at Malthus and his theory. I'm going to pause. Can you, what, what did Malthus say again? Were you able to say, okay, Thomas Malthus was, a, um, said that population was going to grow exponentially, that J curve, well, food was going to go geo, grow geometrically. Were you able to kind of put this in as terms of time? You know, we're talking eight, you know, that 18th century. So kind of that turn of the century, industrial revolution coming around the same time, we're seeing this population explode. And so understanding that there, he, he was really worried, how are we going to feed that population? We remember that J curve. Okay. So we start there. Then we take a look at, okay, if I look at this and I look at world population by region, there is a time where you would go, yeah, I can see what Thomas Malthus was talking about. You can see kind of that exponential growth. So that impact, um, when we talk about um, that IMP, we're taking a look at impact and interactions. And so, okay, we see kind of that exponential growth. We could see some other things happening, but do we start to see things leveling off with that S curve in some areas? If I start to look very slight in Asia, this one doesn't show us as well as some of the other ones. We can start to see it here in terms of the global trend, definitely. But I want us to look at that pink with the continent of Africa in particular, okay? So we do know as demographers um, have studied this, we know that we are still seeing um, high population growth growth a lot due to the type of economic demands that are press, um, placed on people in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Um, we talk about access to education. So we do know some of those things, but how does that actually impact, right? So we take a look at occurring at different parts of the world. Let's dive into kind of a little bit about this Malthusian theory and maybe different parts of the world. So if we looked at caloric intake, right? Because food production, feeding people. Take a look where Kenya is on uh, average daily per capita supply of calories versus maybe the United States. Okay. So we could say the how and the why. So we could take a look at um, arable land. We could take a look at industrialization, mechanization of crops or of, of farming. Um, the, population and how it is those resources are distributed among the population. Then take a look at the share of the population that's undernourished 
you know, in 2017. And we can definitely see that population growth is and food supply is definitely a concern still in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we could take a look then trying to really connect. So I said that, that why, right? Take a look at arable land. Okay. So if I look at those sub Saharan Africa, we see a lot of areas that struggle with uh, land used for arable farmland. And you're going to say, well, Mrs. Brandt, some of those colors we see in the United States, um, yeah, we're able to feed our people. So remember, I added in that concept of mechanization, right? And so our farming techniques are going to help us to produce more food to spread, um, to share with, with our people uh, more easily. We're going to get into green revolution here in a little bit, but the expense of having uh, using some of those fertilizers and pesticides present a challenge for countries that might not be at the same economic level as others. The last thing that I would want to point out in some of these areas too is really this concept, right? Of, and we're going to dive into a little bit more coming up, that concept of carrying capacity. So keep that in the back of your mind because how does all of this connect? So we're shifting, we're on our third one, right? Now what we want, to, what's a likely outcome? So we're back to taking a look at high population, right? And so now what we'd wanna do is kind of make some predictions. So if we go back to what we're looking at how and why, and we're talking climate and we're talking arable land, and now we're diving into what could be some potential outcomes. Remember I said, keep carrying capacity in the back of your mind. Where, you know, what outcome, do you predict in a particular geographic scenario? So if we were talking about the ability to feed where population was continuing to grow and we're, but not at the same rate at food, could we see where we would see some areas struggle more than others? I would also say those pressures placed of population on the land, right? So if I look at population density in particular, take a look at India, right? The number of people per kilometer of land area. And so how does that also, you know, where do we talk about how does where and how people live impact global culture, political and economic patterns? So people moving to cities for jobs, right? And so more people that are putting pressures on those resources, or how about more people living on that arable land makes it difficult to feed the, our population. If there's more people than food that we're um, able to feed, right, that's going to increase, um, it's going to decrease our carrying capacity, right? Difficult to feed them. So things that we want to reflect on, the economy, what type of jobs are happening? So the pull to the cities, um, the pressure placed on the land, the landscape, could it also be we could look at heavier pollution in some of those areas, in particular, if we looked at the eastern coast of China, for example, but also culture. If we take a look at number of kids um, in sub-Saharan Africa, those higher numbers or the pressure um, to have a boy in patriarchal, more traditionally patriarchal societies such as India. So we then look at those trends and we see also there could be some consequences or some impact on health and well being. So we go back to two skills ago describing patterns that we've seen as far as aging populations. So, life expectancy where do we see people living longer? So, we start by describing, but then we could take a look at that how, the why, what are some potential impacts, right? So, if I look at the United States, if I look at China, um, taking a look at them living longer. Um, but if we continue having that same number of kids, that's going to cause kind of that population boom, right? If I take a look at places um, such as um, Namibia or taking a look at Botswana or taking a look at um, places such as uh, Nigeria or Chad, things that we'll see, right? Not living as long, but if I'm still the need, I still need people to work. So that might mean not as many old people and, and more young people. So what am I getting at? Da, 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 da. Let's write dependency ratios. So what I was just talking about, right? Take a look at sub-Saharan Africa and some of those countries that I mentioned. 
changes in population affect a place, economy, culture, and politics. So we could then really look at, okay, kids in some of these countries that I just mentioned, talking about Nigeria or Chad or Namibia, needing kids to um, help farm the land. Um, the choice between sending a kid to school and helping them bring money into the family, I'm probably going to choose sending kids to school. Um, I could also say um, agricultural, I need lots of hands on the helping us farm if we're not as mechanized as some of those other countries. Um, there's potential there though, right? So I'm kind of doing some doom and gloom, but there's some potential, right? That if I have this youth dependency, um, at some point, if we can improve healthcare, could this build a really strong workforce for the future? Potential, right? The problem is, is it could also put some drains on society, such as if we end up with aging populations. So sometimes if I look at aging populations for some of those flipped areas, we might talk about things where people are coming up with um, antinatalist policies, right? Where we're saying, okay, um, for old age, sorry, pronatalist policies, pronatalist, where we want people to have more kids. We've seen this happen in some of our um, Northern European countries, our Scandinavian countries of, okay, we have an aging population. What does the future look like? How do we bring in more children? How do we bring in, how do we build for that future? Unlike here with the youth dependency, we've seen countries put in place sometimes some antinatalist policies of trying to slow that population growth. So when we were just doing, we were starting to dip our toe into looking at similarities and differences. You know, for example, if I if we go back to taking a look at those dependency ratios, and I really dove into um, antinatalist and pronatalist and took took a look at different countries, or if I wanted to look at India versus China with similar populations, I'd be leaning towards um, 2D, which is the significance of those similarities and differences at different locations or times. So what are they and does it really matter? So I'm going back to our undernourished um, map that we saw earlier in this in this video or in our, in our AP Live um, conversation here today. And what you see, right, we look for those patterns, similarities. We see some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. We see, um, this is 2017, we see countries, even, even India struggling a little bit, you know, making sure that everybody has um, enough calories uh, to sustain life, right? But if I think even further, I think about the Green Revolution, okay? So the Green Revolution is impacting some of these countries different than others. So think 1960s, right, time, but location shifts of how it impacted and when it impact, impacted those um, countries. So let me just back up real quick. When we talk about the Green Revolution, right? So new crops are introduced. We're talking about that that we can grow in different areas that are um, going to help us to better management of that, those systems. We're going to introduce some pesticides to help crops um, bring in better yields and, and, and fight off um, insects so that their likelihood of them making are better. We're going to introduce fertilizer to help with soil and helping to produce the best crops possible. We point this out because the intent here was how do we make sure we're able to feed these growing populations? So two countries in particular, we really dug into, take a look at Mexico. And if we take a look at Mexico in 1960s um, and, and we look at population that steady increase, right? Um, but if we look at adjustments that they made, they really were focusing on wheat and grains in particular by focusing on increasing their use of machinery, technology. How can we uh, maximize our use of this land to produce more um, for people? And what we see is an increase in the cereal production and feeding of our people. And so I mean, take a look at this. I mean, under zero to 5% are what we would consider undernourished. And a lot of that has to do with we've seen these increase in these yields. India, we see a similar trajectory, 
they're going to do a slightly different approach. They'll do some mechanization, but a lot of this is going to talk about the types of crops, crops trying to get some double, triple crops of, of their rice, trying to get uh, more nutrient rich materials, but about increasing those yields, making things a little more weather resistant in, in, um, in India. We also see an increase in production here. The difference is though, that population. And so when we're talking about a billion people, um, how do we continue to make sure that people, all people have access to that food? So there's pros and cons, right? We're talking about, we are providing more food, trying to make sure that both of these, um, looking at the green revolution, right, of, of feeding people, but we do know that there's some consequences, right, um, as well. And so some of those consequences we could be seen through urbanization. Um, the more mechanized we become, the less people we need on the farms. And so there's this demand, right, of people moving to the cities because this is where jobs are. Go back to the beginning, describe those patterns. Where do we see more people living rural versus urban? We know that across the world, the common trend is the people in urban areas are surpassing that rural population. It's happening everywhere, that urbanization, rural to urban movement. But the degree to which it impacts people is different. Some of that is based off of time and some of that is based off of space. We could take a look at um, easing into it, depending when, when this happened, you know, the jobs, the jobs happened and then kind of pulled people. If the mechanization is happening first and there's not enough um, people to kind of produce, it's going to push people more to the city. The other thing that's happening is as these cities grow or other things, it's, we're seeing more, this is really focusing on desertification. So kind of that growth of our deserts, but the pressure that we're putting on our water resources is creating some a strain. And if the majority of your people are farmers, um, and you need that water, it's going to probably push more and more people to the city. We could even just look at urban growth and causing pushing those pressures of those urban areas. And so what we've seen is the expanse of the urban areas, that loss of some of our farmland um, is creating challenges for how do we feed people. We also know is that we could take those you know, consequences of those agricultural practices, taking a look at employment in agriculture, the percent that's female, a lot of this has to do with, um, again, heavy agricultural societies. We can pay females less than we pay men, but a lot of times it's all hands on deck as well. We need um, everybody helping so we can produce more food um, for our population. Whew. That was a lot, right? So what does this look like when we go to take a test? So let's take a look. We're going to break down each one of these skills. So if we take a look at, remember 2A is our idea of describing, okay? So what would one expect to find in a population with a relatively young age structure? So I'm going to pause. So think about the describe when we're talking about those patterns, right? We're talking about kind of where do we see those? What are some of those characteristics? A relatively young age structure, we typically find in LDCs. And in your head, you're going, okay, typically what type of jobs might people be doing? Why might we find more kids there? So how that might that play out in an FRQ? Describe a typical location of squatter settlements within urban areas of mega city, cities on the global periphery. So remember, we're describing what are those characteristics. So I'm going to pause. So describing, did you talk about proximity to the mega cities, to so the edge of the city? Um, elsewhere built other than the edge, as long as we're explaining it. For example, there's some um, within the Latin American um, model where we will see kind of closer or more integrated within India, the Southeast Asian or the South Asian, just because we're looking at how and when cities developed. Um, a lot of it has to do with transportation. Um, we could talk about squatter settlements, right? Vacant or undesirable land 
or land where there's not a clear title, this is how we would describe where those squatter settlements, what the typical location would be. When we get to B, right, now we're explaining how or why this occurs. Okay, so look at this. 70s, we've got changes in social roles, lifestyles, employment patterns in Europe, Canada, the United States, and how they've affected overall population. So in my head, though, I first go, okay, Europe, Canada, US, what do they kind of all have in common when I talk about um, population and some of these other ideas? How might this might impact them? Pausing for you. Right, because what we saw, especially in the 70s, we saw more access for women to equal opportunities through school, through um, women's rights movements, and so those de decreased total fertility rates. When we talked, did this definitely in video one when we talked about the impact of school on fertility rates. Okay, so explain how we're on to be. What might it look like in a FRQ, explain how changes in population have affected the percent of land um, that is used for farming in the Middle East. So kind of really diving in. So we got a Middle East and North Africa. So you've got to go and find, right? Got to go and find that line. So what's happening? Um, and so, and then I also, in my head, I always kind of like, what countries are we talking about? And so hopefully you're looking, thinking about maybe Egypt, maybe you're talking about, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, maybe we're looking at Iraq. So what's happening in those areas? And my head also goes back to climate, like, okay, pretty dry, right? So what is happening? So you can always pause and read this, but a couple of things that I wanted to point out, you know, that we know these are drier, but we know population has been increasing. So they're drier climates. So do, population growth has increased the demand. So we might have to import some of those that food. Um, population growth led to significant, if I look at the first one, significant increase in land. Um, and so we really, the pressures that it's placed on the land um, have been a challenge. We also could look at the third one down there, uh, how intensely we use that land. So we're going to have to irrigate, but it all goes back, right? If we're going back to the climate, it's in an arid area. And so we've got to maybe use some fertilizers, some pesticides as well, because we've got to make sure we're meeting the needs of the people that are there. 2C. Okay. So when we look at 2C, now it's our likely outcome. So which of the following best explains a Neo-Malthusian perspective of the Green Revolution? Okay. So Neo-Malthusians, remember Malthus population exponentially, food geometrically, but kind of makes sense on a perspective they might have, but that we were talking, remember 18th century, now it's what might they have on green revolution 60s and 70s. So pause, think through this. So still green revolution represents a jump in agricultural technology, but population will still grow faster than our ability to produce food um, over the long run. And we've seen this in some areas, a lot of Neo-Malthusians today are gonna really focus on resources, maybe not necessarily food, or they might focus on the unequal distribution, but even we know that there are areas where population, we just did this today, that are still growing faster than food production in that area. Okay. Sometimes it gets challenging to have a multiple choice question, but this one I want to keep, we're still on 2C um, and taking a look then, right, of potential income uh, or outcome. I don't know why I said that. Uh, explain two impacts of co coffee farming on producing countries. Okay. So producing countries, take a look, where are they located? Okay. Through the tropics, those highland areas. Okay. So what are some impacts it might have on the producing countries? could increase economic development, right? It could bring in more growth and then we could invest in infrastructure, right? Um, it could also though, if we're only focusing on coffee, that single commodity dependency, what happens if it fails, then our whole country could fail as well. Profits actually leaving the country. Um, environment, right? Are there some harmful um, effects of sometimes the chemicals, or how about overuse of water, or maybe even deforestation in some areas. Um, and then maybe sometimes you could also look at how we're using the land, right? Uh, cash crops, 
luxury crops versus necessarily feeding our family. I know you guys think that coffee is sustenance, but it's not going to sustain you your entire life or throughout day after day. So that idea of that shift from traditional to commercial agriculture. So what we did there, right, we're predicting kind of what our outcomes based off of what would happen if um, on those producing com- countries, uh, coffee part of that global network. 2D. Okay, so similarities and differences. So here we're looking at locational advantages um, important to the development of the earliest cities. Okay, so I, in my head, I go early cities. What really was it some locational advantage um, that really, and there's some good answers here. What we want to really focus on what probably is the best answer. Well, I'm pausing. What do you think is the best answer? We got to be able to feed and defend our people, right? And so when we talk about some of these other things, there's some good things that are happening here. We know some cities will develop there, but earliest we're really focused on that farmland and making sure they're very uh, that we can defend our um, our people as well. So let's take a look at a FRQ. Explain how increased access to education for women is likely to affect roles in agriculture within a developing country. So we've talked about this. Hopefully we've got it. There's a lot here. So again, feel free to pause and read through. I'm not going to go through every single one of these. Um, But a couple of things when we're talking about, you know, access to education, what does it give us? Well, it gives people more opportunities, right? And so what you want to be really specific, opportunities outside the home, maybe different types of employment, looking at technical or administrative work. Um, We see women increase access to financial resources and and making investments in, maybe even in agriculture. Um, We see if more education, sometimes we might see women owning more land. We talked about that in video one as well. Um, We also know that there might be more education going to urban areas then, right? More education, like continuing on, maybe getting higher education, and then maybe even learning things and then applying those new techniques to increase productivity or even yields um, of that farmland. Last but not least, this is one of those that this isn't kind of tough to do a multiple choice question on. And so one of those things that we take a look at, okay, is this the degree to what, to which, right? So we can clearly see it. So we look here, um, a country's economy changes over time, taking a look at total fertility rate. So access to specialized women's health in more developed countries is likely to affect a country's total fertility. Okay, so take a look at these, when we look at acceptable answers, notice how that word decrease, right? That's the degree to which. So decrease because women have access to information about personal reproductive health, they tend not to have as many kids Um, because access to birth, we're going to see decrease access to birth control. So focusing more on planned versus um, unplanned births. We could take a look at some other options here as well, but this idea of women having the ability and access to things really through education, um, we can see, remember it says through laws or policies. And so this idea of making sure though we hit that word decrease that in MDC, so understanding where we're talking about and to that degree. We did a ton today things that we did, we spent some time figuring out how we describe, look for those patterns, right? Describe it. What are those characteristics? We also spent some time really making that how and the why, okay, of understanding kind of that being able to explain maybe taking climate and taking a look at, okay, so if it's this climate, okay, that's our why, but how is that impacting productivity? Then predicting, right? What's a likely outcome? And here we did this taking a look at, um, take a look at Malthusian theory and really kind of understanding that. And then different locations and times taking a look at green revolution in different locations and its impact even today. And finally, explain that degree, what we're looking at here, right? That amount, okay? 
we looked at the increase, we looked at the decrease, we looked at um, kind of where do we th see things clustered, the, the impact of population pressures on those areas as well. I really hope that you're starting to see these connections and how all of these pieces fit together and that you'll join us for our next lesson with Ms. Neuroth, where she's going to dive into even more skills. So I want to thank you for tuning in today, for hanging in there with me, and we hope that you'll continue to join us for other videos or even subscribe for more videos. Have a great one.